title of Ginny Nebraski's Yo-Yo Boing is a bilingual pun. On the one hand, a yo-yo is of course a children's toy, a wooden terracotta or metal axle or bobbin with weighted discs on either side to which a string is attached such that when the string is wound and unwound through movements of the hand manipulating the free end, the axle rises and falls, spinning as it comes and goes. Let me show you. Skilled players can direct the device's kinetic energy to perform a whole range of tricks. Yo-yos are found almost everywhere. There are also diabolos, or Chinese yo-yos, for which the string, which here has two rods or sticks tied at either end, is not attached to the axle, which can therefore, for instance, be thrown high into the air. And the toy has a long pedigree. Ancient Greek vases show children playing with them as long ago as 440 BCE. On the other hand, in Spanish, yo is the first person singular subject pronoun, I. So, yo yo could indicate either an insistent affirmation of the self, me, me, or two selves, two eyes, perhaps one self split in two, in dialogue, back and forth, to and fro like a yo-yo, out and back, driven by their own pent-up energies. What is more, yo-yo boing is also a cultural reference, probably unfamiliar to many readers. It is the nickname of comedian and actor Luis Antonio Rivera, a mainstay of Puerto Rican TV in the 1960s and 1970s. Rivera came up with his moniker when playing in a radio adaptation of the Archie comics. He picked Yo-Yo as a sort of translation of Jughead, Archie's best friend and sidekick in the series. Mangled and reborn in the relocation of white-bred small-town Riverdale to the Hispanophone Caribbean. Brasky's novel, too, is concerned with the transformations forced by linguistic and cultural mobility and their repercussions, with what can and what cannot be translated and assimilated across borders or even just between two people, two eyes. It is interested in what goes out, but does not necessarily come back, at least not in the same form. Yo-Yo Boing is full of movement and motion. And yet, like a yo-yo, in, in some ways it never seems to go anywhere, or end up much further on from where it started. The book lacks anything like a conventional plot or plot development. It consists almost entirely of dialogue, or a series of dialogues, between characters who are never fully fleshed out, but who seem to be graduate students, writers, artists, teachers and young professionals living and working in New York City. Many of those who speak or are spoken about come from outside the United States, and they're still defining themselves, still trying to navigate the social complexities of the urban United States, at the end of the American century, and at the cusp of the new millennium. They are mindful that they are more privileged and more ambitious than many others. But they are equally aware that they remain still, somehow, outsiders. 
the future is open and indefinite. This is before 9-11, before the long wars on terror and in the Middle East and Central Asia that would scar the next couple of decades, putting pay to this brief window of US geopolitical confidence and generalized potentiality. It is before the blowback by which the world's sole superpower reaped the consequences of its neo-imperial mistakes in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Soon the fun and games would have to stop. But Brasky shows the anxieties embedded even in the otherwise swinging late 90s. Some of the characters she ventriloquizes or describes will make good on all the swirling potential that energizes this book. Others fear that they'll be among those who burn out or are left behind. Above all, Yo-Yo Boing portrays a moment in time when one narrative had come to an end, but another had yet to begin. There is an English translation of Brasky's novel, and while I have no doubt that the translator, Tess O'Dwyer, has done an admirable job. The very idea seems perverse, or to miss the point of the novel. For the book is constitutively split between languages, never coming to rest entirely in Spanish, or entirely in English. There are whole sections or pages in one language or another. The brief first and third sections, for instance, have English titles, Close Up and Blackout, respectively, but are otherwise more or less fully in Spanish. In the much longer second section, aptly entitled Blow Up, surely a nod to the Italian director Michelangelo Antonioni's London set and English language film version of a short story by Argentine writer Julio Cortasa, more cultural border crossing and hybridity. Brasky puts a dynamite stick to such monolingualism. In the book's long middle section, the prose slips constantly back and forth between the two languages, sometimes in the middle of a paragraph, or even in the middle of a sentence. Here is how the section starts. Abre la tu. ¿Por qué yo? Tú tienes las keys. Yo te las entregué a ti. Además, I left mine adentro. ¿Por qué las dejaste adentro? Porque I knew you had yours. ¿Por qué dependes de mí? Just open it and make it fast. In just seven short lines, 43 words, there are seven switches between the languages, sometimes for just one word. Tú tienes las keys. At times, one of the speakers picks up on the other's choice of language. Adentro stays adentro. At times, they translate the other's word into the other language. I left mine becomes las dejaste. All this interlingual movement adds vitality to the argument we're witnessing. At stake is also, in part, very literally the terms of the debate the language in which, it, in which it is to be expressed. By contrast, the English translation is inevitably much more drab. You open it. Why me? You've got the keys. I gave them to you. Besides, I left mine inside. Why did you leave them inside? Because I knew you had yours. Why do you depend on me? Just open it and make it fast. It is not the same, because it is the same. Because in the translation, unlike the original, sameness triumphs over difference. Much of the original vitality is thereby left behind, like the keys. What is the effect of this bilingualism, or translingualism? 
What, if anything, is the logic of these shifts from one language to another? If you yourself speak two languages and sometimes do something similar, for instance in conversation with friends, you might ask yourself how and why you do so. Why are the first and third parts of the novel solely in Spanish? And what impression is given by the constant switching in the long second part? If you were asked to translate the book, how would you go about it? Pause the video. Write down some ideas in your notebook. Why do you do that? Alfa piña colada. But I'll be right back. One way to translate Yo-Yo Boing might be to retain its bilingualism, but to switch the languages, to translate it into English and French, say, to conjure up the texture of urban Montreal, or into French and Arabic, mimicking the linguistic mixture of the Parisian banlieue. But such mixtures are no doubt different in these other contexts? Or what about translating the English elements of the novel into Spanish at the same time as translating the Spanish into English? A monolingual English or Spanish speaker would have to consult both the translation and the original simultaneously in order to piece the book together. But that would beg the question as to whether the shifts from one language to another are unmotivated, contingent, or whether Spanish is used in particular circumstances to particular effect, better to express, say, the intimate and the personal, with English reserved for other uses and situations. The point about bilingualism is that a speaker could, in theory, speak wholly in one language or the other. But they switch codes when somehow it feels right to say something in English rather than Spanish, and vice versa. It is not that they have no preference for one language over the other, but that when they combine the two, those preferences are inconstantly changing, sometimes from one word or phrase to the next better in English for this, better in Spanish for that. On the one hand, the fluidity of the repeated transitions between languages is itself a form of translation, not least if we consider the root of that word, from the Latin trans, across or beyond, and latus, the past participle of ferre, to carry or bear to carry across. The characters in Yo-Yo Boing are incessantly in translation, as they make the conversation Yo-Yo between linguistic codes and registers, not only from English to Spanish and back again, but also from philosophical musing or aesthetic self-reflection to mundane domestic disagreements from high-minded talk of art and literature to gossip and complaint. On the other hand, beyond all this, there is a scatological register, a language of the body, a body also in constant movement, as the novel opens, becoming elephant, becoming giraffe, that resists the fixed, fixed categories of codification or categorization as either one thing or the other. This is the boing of the title, the onomatopoeia of a word that seeks to be pure sound, to shrug off meaning to comic effect, just as Luis Antonio Rivera, the original Yo-Yo Boing, would supposedly insert the non-word boing 
into conversational lulls, siphoning off seriousness in a play with, but also against language itself. Brasky's novel resists translation, both because it is already in translation, and translation cannot be translated, and because it touches on the untranslatable, on the limits of language and meaning. It dares, up to pick, it dares us to pick up a signal from what is otherwise mere sound, and asks, what is the tipping point where sense suddenly, if precariously, prevails? There is so much movement, and yet nothing quite happens in Brasky's novel. As critic Christiane van Heysendonck observes, there are resonances between Yo-Yo Boing and the likewise bilingual Irish-French dramatist and novelist Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. Not least, in, the, in both texts, there's perpetually the promise that we're on the cusp of something, but the anticipated event never quite comes. The only thing that happens in Yo-Yo Boing is precisely the negation of all action, Van Heysendonck suggests. In the meantime, while they await whatever it is that may be coming, there is conversation within confines that none of the characters seem able to break. Compare the famous lines from Godot. Well, shall we go? Yes, let's go. They do not move. With Brasky's, I'm sick and tired of you, and I don't want to hear your voice again. Okay, I won't talk. But you continue. And you. Beckett's play is even explicitly referenced in Yo-Yo Boing, as one of the novel's voices describes her writer's block. The problem comes when I realize I've done nothing, and I'm still in bed, rocking, waiting for Godot, or a change of climate. I get so angry at myself that I stand up and write my rage and feel good again, and I change, and I change, and I change, but I never really change. Constant transformation, to and fro, as in the Is Fort Da me? or Gone There game that Sigmund Freud reports a small child playing in a bid to master the distress of maternal absence. But not enough, at least as yet, to make a real difference. Alternatively, we might think that the book itself is the event to which the many conversations it contains are ultimately leading. From this perspective, the story that the book tells is the story of its own writing, as its author shakes off her doubts about register and language, turning a self-reflexivity that might otherwise be disabling into the subject of something like a novel. In the words of critic Ellen Jones, Yo-Yo Boing is largely about the experience of writing, or trying to write, a work like Yo-Yo Boing. The book's publication will be the triumph of the authorial eye, fixing and transcending the constant movement of the multivocal oral discourse on which the novel draws, by committing it to print. The novel's squabbling multiplicity will be radically terminated with the blackout with which it ends, the curtain descending, the drama put to bed. Nothing particularly resistant would remain. We might even question whether the translingual hubbub had been all that radical in the first place. As José Torres Padilla puts it, the text is rife with bourgeois fetishes, frivolous talk about material things, and a cloying concern with name-dropping. This is a harsh judgment, but understandable insofar as the book's many characters seem to be almost exclusively young cultural professionals, writers, editors, graduate students, professors, literary agents and the like, 
who chat loftily, pun intended, about Fellini or T.S. Eliot, while envying each other's successes, and anxiously scrambling both for critical appreciation and for the grants that under underwrite their precarious lifestyles. But perhaps something else may happen, in a future to which the characters are necessarily blind. Another version of the plot would focus on how the book starts with a notional unity. The woman examining herself in the mirror, in the novel's opening section, that very soon multiplies, first into the split subject, fractured by her own reflection, then with the dialogue between the two roommates, also lovers, arguing about their apartment door, who in turn take on multiple names, Kiko, Kika, Chipo, Chipi, Chipa, before being joined by a multitude more, who come and go, back and forth, intervening and interrupting, until the eye declares that she can't bear being myself, the person I just was, the one I no longer am, the one who escaped with the moment that no longer is. In a reverse or undoing of the mirror stage, postulated by French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, for whom it is in the infant's confrontation with their mirror image that the I is precipitated in a primordial form. Here, the I escapes, like a yo-yo that breaks from its string and rolls out of sight as the curtain comes now crashing or bouncing down without putting any, an end to anything. Boing. The difference between these three readings of the novel, one in which the book is a portrait of suspended animation, awaiting an event that never comes, another in which the published text puts an end to the restless vitality on which it feeds, and a third in which something unpredictably escapes, may be ultimately undecidable. But each references different ways of conceiving what the novel is doing with time or temporality, which are all at stake in one particularly dense passage, almost exactly at the mid midpoint of the text, page 122 of 247. In the first case, we have a permanent conversation or multilogue that may range back and forth, but always returns to an eternal present, arrested development that never comes to any climax. Arrested, arrested libido, the book tells us a character quotes someone else's phrase. In the second case, the classic temporality of the novel form belatedly imposes itself ensuring there is a beginning, a middle, and an end, putting a stop to things, with a conclusion that reasserts the writer's authority. She had explained that arrested meant delayed, retarded, but I thought arrestada, like confined, imprisoned, like halt, you're under arrest. This is writing as police action, taking down speech as evidence to determine agency, responsibility, blame. Finally, there is the notion of kairos, the Greek term for a temporality that stands in contrast to the measurable, divisible clock time that is chronos. It means the right time for action, the critical moment, indicating an openness to the future, to an unknowable event that may still arrive. Like a thief, in the night. For the Italian Marxist Antonio Negri, Kairos is the quality of time in the instant, the moment of rupture and opening of temporality. It is the present, but a singular and open present, the modality of time through which being opens itself, attracted by the void of the limit of time. In Brasky's novel, Kairos is linked to repetition and to the surrender of authority, 
to a persistence that survives even constant translation. You have no right to transform my words, especially when I am dictating what I am hearing from the blind. Just write every word I say. That's Kairos. That's what I do. I am just repeating what I hear. What authority do I have? None whatsoever. Hear this voice, that of the writer, who is in fact revealed to be merely a mediating instance between orality and its transcription, addresses her editor, who is seeking to smooth out the text's translingual mistakes. <coughs> but she may as well also be talking to us, the novel's readers. Now I can lay down like the dead, she tells us, and wait till you make the writing work. The misspellings and the nuances, after all, what do I care? I see in them your future trademarks. You are going to be, by all means, an original. In this version, Brasky puts the novel's fate in our hands. A change is coming, if that is what we want. <coughs> 